The church is a relatively unknown religious institution when you consider the whole world. And even where it's somewhat known in the United States, it's not known as it ought to be. One reason is because people will not read the Bible. Another reason is when they read it, they do not know how to rightly divide it, 2 Timothy 2.15. And then there can be various reasons that people read it, none of which are the reason they ought to read it. But be that as it may, people don't understand the importance of the church. And if they think of the church at all, it is the denominational concept of the church which did not come on the scene until 1,500 years after the church was established as recorded in Acts chapter 2. But for those who have found the gospel, who know it from the heart of obeyed it, been added to the Lord's church, and are determined to live steadfastly according to the truth, they have an obligation to point out the truth of the gospel concerning how to be saved, where the Lord saves people, and that gets you immediately then to the church that is described and revealed only on the pages of the New Testament. Which also means that part of the duty of members of the church is to defend the church. In fact, to oppose all error. Error being that which is contrary to the teachings of the Bible in general and the New Testament in particular. Consider with me, then, this lesson on refuting error. Read with me Psalm 119, verses 97 through 104. Psalm 119, verses 97 through 104. The psalmist says, Oh, how love I thy law. It is my meditation all the day. Thou through thy commandments hast made me wiser than mine enemies, for they are ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for thy testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the ancients, because I keep thy precepts. I have refrained my feet from every evil way, that I might keep thy word. I have not departed from the judgments, for thou hast taught me. How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. And then this important point at the end. Through thy precepts I get understanding. And what's the conclusion? Therefore, I hate every false way. If you cannot make that statement truly believing it and meaning it, there's something wrong with your concept of Christianity. Because that's the word of God. That is the Bible. I hate every false way. That doesn't mean that you hate everybody. Well, after all, aren't we here to strive to do the Lord's will to save souls? But people can get some strange ideas about what it is to hate something and to love something. There are those brethren who get rather upset when denominations are publicly refuted. I remember in my first local work almost 50 years ago, one lady who at that time was as old as my grandparents, that would make her 120-something today. I'd preached a sermon, and she came out and said, why can't you just preach the gospel and leave everybody else alone? I've never, I've never really understood how to do that. I looked at Jesus Christ to see, as my perfect model, did he do that? And I can't find him doing that. I can't find any of the apostles doing that. I can't find any of the prophets doing that. In fact, I would urge everyone who would be faithful to God, especially those who would be good teachers of the truth and preachers of the gospel, go to the prophets of the Old Testament and learn how to preach to the people. And if you can't get that from them, there is the master teacher. God had one son, and he made him a teacher of truth. There is a fear that those visiting the assemblies of worship who are not members of the church or friends or relatives are going to be offended by plain language. They actually will understand that where they are, they're lost and they need to do something. Wouldn't that be terrible for the church to get that across to those that are lost and need to do something? But that's our job. That's what Jesus did. Read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And he was pretty plain at it. 
even to those nearest and dearest to him. Would you have kept following him if he turned to you because of what you said about what he was about to do and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things of God but the things of men. Well, I think I know a whole lot of brethren that have said, That's what he feels. Uh, we're going to have nothing else to do with that. But it begins to tell us that we can let the ways of the world and false religions influence our own minds. In the end, there's more allowance for sin to continue unchecked. Now, folks, sin is the only thing that keeps us out of heaven. And Christ overcame the sin problem. And the gospel is God's power to save us. And the New Testament system is the only system that will save us. And it demands compliance with the Lord's will, who is the way, now watch it, the truth and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by him, John 14, 6. Is it possible that we do not mind our friends following the broad road to hell as long as they travel it in good humor and we can remain friendly? I can't find that attitude in the Bible. I can't find that disposition of heart. I can't find where that's a part of Christianity. Now, if you found it, I really wish you would bring it to me because I've spent over half a century trying to find where the Bible taught me that you could just have a good humor sermon and everybody have their sins dealt with and know they ought to repent and turn from them, even to identify them and know what they are. There must be indignation in the faithful members of the church aimed at error. Again, notice Psalm 119, 104. Thy, through thy precepts I get understanding. Well, do we? He said when he got understanding, therefore, that's a conclusion, I hate every false way. Not some false ways. But I hate every false way. Paul said to the church in Philippi, in chapter 1 and verse 17, that he was set, and that Greek word means like concrete, he was set for the defense of the gospel. Paul saw his duty of defending the gospel. All of it as a whole and every component part of it. Do I have that view? The problem with a lot of us is that we're far more akin in our disposition of heart and viewpoint to the denominations than we are to ancient, pure, primitive New Testament Christianity. A lot of people are appearing to be members of the church when why they were baptized may have been to make a wife happy or a husband happy or somebody happy, but God wasn't too much on their mind because it really didn't make them any difference one way or the other. They just had this view of good humor and let's all just stay in a happy mode so I'll do what they want me to do because I really don't think God requires this. But what will it hurt? I'll just do it to make everybody happy. If that was the disposition of heart that you had when you were baptized, you're still just as lost as you can be and outside the body of Christ. I know that because I can read my Bible and understand it. In Romans 6, 17 and 18, But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin. Now listen. But ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then made free from sin. But as I said, Paul was set for the defense. For the defense of what? Well, he dealt with the Galatian churches and the problems that were among those congregations. And we find these words in the beginning, in the first chapter of his letter to the Galatians. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel. Literally, the Greek has a gospel of a different kind, meaning a gospel of a different kind from what I preach to you. Because we all know there's but one gospel, Romans 1, 16, which, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you. If you have people preaching a wrongly divided Bible or preaching man-made doctrine and philosophies, they're troubling you. Well, in what way do they trouble you? They blind you to the truth of God's Word. Notice they would pervert the gospel of Christ. Well, that means the gospel of Christ can be perverted. You take something that's right and wholesome and good and you pervert it when you add something to it or take something away from it. It's not the same thing. 
But though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. American Standard 1901 says anathema. It means cut off, cut off from God. False doctrine believed and practiced will cut you off from God. If not, make sense out of this. Why would he write this to the churches? After all, weren't they Christians? Then he repeats himself, and that always gets my attention when inspiration repeats itself, especially right after they said the thing the first time. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach unto you any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? And many people today, including preachers and elders, must say, we're here satisfied and persuade men. And that's a shame. Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be a servant of Christ. Galatians 1, 6 through 10. Would you say the, these words are rather strong words? So notice the strong language in these verses against any other gospel than the New Testament teaches. You have in Matthew 15, 1 through 14, our Lord dealing with the Pharisees, and Jeff has done such a good job on Sunday morning of really setting out just what the Pharisees, the sect of the Jews, was like and what they did. And Jesus had some very strong words for them. When his disciples pointed out that his words were offending his audience, Jesus didn't apologize for it. I also had another lady come out one time, and you know, these are sweet old ladies. That's the way I describe them. Sweet old ladies. And this sweet old lady said, What kind of devil hunt are you going to be up to next? <laughs> uh, you know, sweet people on the outside sometimes are worse than a sour pickle on the inside. They just have learned over the years to be sweet on the outside and meaner than a junkyard dog on the inside. You just got to know what to say to bring the real person out. Some way over my lifetime, I've been able to do that. Uh, we have a misunderstanding of the words of love and truth. Let me say that again. We have a misunderstanding of the words of love and truth. People will read Paul in Ephesians chapter 4, 15 and 16 as he addresses the church in that part of his letter. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body fitly, to get, uh, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body into the edifying, that's spiritual building up, of itself in love. And we are told after a verse like or this verse or other verses like it are, are quoted to us or read to us, that you, you see, growth comes from love. And that's right in the context of what Paul's saying to the church here. No doubt about it. But here's what their view is. Love never hurts. You don't even believe that in your own family. You don't even believe that in rearing your own children if you rear them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Love can sometimes cause hurts to develop that would they would never develop if you really didn't love somebody. The ultimate love is agape. It means seeking another's highest good. And when applied to man's salvation, it's seeking a person's highest good and getting them to heaven, which means sins must be forgiven. They must therefore recognize their sins and know the remedy the New Testament says for those sins. But how much do you read in the New Testament of people well, especially, I think, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, where the Lord will talk about these people that I was about to, I was about to mention, that they walk in darkness and do not the truth. Or they hear the truth and they run from the light and they go into darkness. What if a parent so loved their children, or parents, that they would never spank them? It's a sin to spank a child. You'll go to hell if you spank that child. You don't love that child. Well, it may be that you don't love it. 
it may be that you want to torture it. And if that's the case with you, in time, you'll probably kill it or neglect it in some way or run off and leave it or whatever else. There'll be all sorts of things show up. But everybody knows what I mean by spanking. And if you don't, I'll read it to you. God's word reads, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. You see, that's very difficult to understand. You'd have to go back and learn Hebrew and study at Harvard to get a Ph.D. in Hebrew to understand that. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Proverbs 13, 24. Now, there are a lot of other scriptures that deal with rearing children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. There are also supposed to be enough sense in parents in the fa- by the fact that they're parents that they understand about wise discipline. They ought to understand that all discipline doesn't require a spanking. So I want you to understand I know that. But the point is, the Word of God, does that move anybody? Says that that's a part of child rearing. Obviously, it's the definition of love that's in conflict with the teachings of the Bible. Because love is always required correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. Do you believe that? If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, wherefore all are partakers, then are ye bastards, or illegitimate, and not sons. Furthermore, we've had fathers of our flesh which corrected us. Now, now let me stop there and talk about corrected us. Corrected us means you've been taught the way to do things. You've had a good example set before you. You've been instructed, but you've deviated from what you've been taught. Now we've got to bring you back. That's correction. So you see, there can't be any correction unless first there's been the proper preventive teaching done and training. So that is presupposed in the scriptures. And we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be subject in subjection? to the Father's spirits, and live. For they verily for a few days hasten, chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit, that we might be partakers of his holiness. What? You mean being taken to the woodshed by the Lord is for, is for my holiness and for my good and my development in the likeness of Christ? Yes, and he says he's going to do it to everyone that loves him. Do you ever pray that you'll love the Lord more? Then what are you by implication praying for? being taken to the woodshed and corrected when it's necessary. That's exactly what you're praying for. Because the Lord says, I do this to those I love, if language has meaning at all. Now, no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous. Well, I can tell you, with my daddy it wasn't joyous, and no seemeth to it. But grievous, indeed so. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby, Hebrews 12, 6 through 11. And so that people can understand that every um, violation in a child's life of the parents' laws doesn't require beating. <laughs> and that's the only way you can say that and make it come out right. It's not beating. It's beating. <laughs> then uh, I say again, parents need to understand when they need to talk to them and to explain to them and other forms of punishment. But why do you inflict any punishment? Why do you ever talk to your kids about what's right and wrong? Why do you say ever, well, just sit down and wait a minute, or go to your room? All of that says that you're trying to punish them in a proper way, commensurate with the crime committed. We have to teach the truth. It's the only hope we've got. Jesus said, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, John 8, 32. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that the truth never hurts. Now, if you don't believe it, then I invite such a close study of the Bible on your part that you'll see that's the case. Paul feared the Galatians. Isn't that amazing? Members of the church, churches of Christ. He feared the Galatians that the Galatians would stop dealing with him because of his truthful teaching. Isn't that amazing? 
He was afraid they wouldn't listen to him anymore because he told them the truth of what they needed to hear. How do I know that? Because I know the question he asked them. Am I, therefore, therefore means in all I've already said, am I, because I've said all these other things to you, am I, therefore, become your enemy because I tell you the truth, Galatians 4.16? You ever ask, why are these things in the Bible? And what do you get out of them when you read them? How do you apply them to your life, to your thinking, to your outlook, to your perspective? As it all pertains to the church of the living God. The truth of the gospel is described in Ephesians 6.17 as a two-edged sword. The sword of the spirit. And a sword has two edges. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Brethren, swords hurt. Swords cut. Swords pierce. And on the very first day that the church was started in Acts 2, the gospel is said to have pricked those people in their inward man, their hearts, their conscience. And it had the right impact because when they saw they were in error, they didn't try to defend it. They didn't try to say, well, we're devout Jews, and that's the way they were described. We're already religious. We're already serving the Father. Uh, we're here. We've traveled for thousands of miles to be here on these feast days as the law of Moses corrected us. No. They have to get off of the sinking ship of Judaism and get on, if you please, the ark of safety, which is the church. So they were pricked in their heart when they learned that the very one they thought was a false messiah was the messiah. And as Peter had charged them, ye have taken and with wicked hands have crucified and slain him. Now that was real cutting language. They were pricked in their heart and they cried unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? The truth, of course, can be misused. We know that. That's what you mean by perversion. You can teach a perverted gospel. Paul saw that. We've read it in Galatians 1. But it doesn't mean that the truth should never cut. Have you ever in the privacy of your home, reading your Bible, thinking about your life, read scriptures that said, Oh, I, I missed it here. Or that pricked me in my heart because I shouldn't have done that or I should have done it or I should have this or that. Don't you know that's what it's designed to do? And, it, and if it will not do that for you, it's not the fault of the Bible because it was designed to do it. It's our hardness of heart. It's where the problem is. The denominational world, to say the best you can say about it, is in a mess. But it started out of a mess and men desiring to build churches contrary to what they could read of in the New Testament. There, nowadays, with morality going crazy, you're going to find more and more churches defending all sorts of gross, crass immorality come under the, coming under the guise of God's grace and mercy and his love and his understanding. All this kind of stuff that other people have used to justify not attending worship and not studying their Bible and not giving of their means as they ought to. Now that same thing is going to be shifted. It's already being done and moved to justify the homosexual and all this kind of thing. There was a newspaper article some time ago about a group of denominations that were organizing to address uh, racial issues. And, and that sounds rather good because the Bible talks about how we should treat one another and our perspective. But here's one thing it said, because this is where they were headed. Full members commit to oppose all marginalization and exclusion in church and society on the basis of such as race, age, gender, forms of disability, sexual orientation, and class. Now, what you have to do with people is say, when, you, when you're trying to talk about racial issues, will you define your terms? Because now those things are included in what is called racism. It wouldn't surprise me to see the country go further away from the truth. And so if we preach against homosexuality, we're racists. 
We're already there, folks, in a lot of places. You don't know your universities and what they're teaching your kids. I mean, this thing, we can spend $100,000 a year to teach our kids how to go to hell. Isn't that fine? You can do it real easy. Just send them to most of the universities because they're dominated by this kind of thing. And you can adopt that view because it's easy. It lets you get along with your neighbor. When I think of our neighbors around us, you got folks living as if they were married, but they're not. Well, they're, they're, I get along with them well, so I just don't want to. I just don't want to say anything about that. I don't want to do that. But I'm a Christian. I'm the I'm the salt of the earth. I'm the light of the world. For what end? To go along, to get along, to let people feel good in their sins, and thus me sin thereby letting them feel good in their sins. How do we preach the gospel without? preaching the gospel. So we have denominations now claiming that homosexual is a race issue. Almost every point in their agenda violates God's good word. Could such errors be addressed? Indeed, not only could, they should, they must. In our generation, we haven't preached the gospel if we don't address the moral issues that are going contrary to the truth. Would, would anyone even listen well, there will be those who won't listen, but that does not mean we should be quiet. I liked what Brother G.K. Wallace told me many, many years ago when a fellow came up to him and said, I'm just tired of hearing about that subject. And he said, you may be tired of it, but you're not you're through hearing about it. And that's exactly the way the church ought to be. The world needs the gospel. That is the only thing that can save a soul is the pure gospel of Christ. Now, who has been commissioned to preach that gospel? The Methodist Church, the United Nations, Congress in Washington. Who? It is the church of Christ as that term is defined and used in the New Testament, Romans 16, 16. And if you're a member of the church, that's you, wherever you are. It's not just the elders, preachers, and Bible class teachers. It's you, young or old. And if you're not able to do it, then God says, get able and preach it. That's not an optional thing, folks. Heaven will not be your home if you don't take these things seriously and then do what you can where you are with what you have. Why are there denominations? Well, they develop their various creeds and doctrines and prayer books and catechisms and councils of men and synods, uh, names and all sorts of things. All of them contrary to what you can read in your own New Testament you may be holding right now. These denominations are not reluctant to advertise their names nor their doctrines. Why should those defending the truth tie themselves down and not refute falsehood when we have it plainly said? Jude was going to write a letter concerning the common salvation, but something happened that said, I've got to set that aside. And then he says, I have to write telling you to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Well, that's the preacher's job. No, it's not only the preacher's job. It's the elders and the deacons and every member. It's your job to do it. And if you're letting somebody else do it, then see how the Lord feels about that on the day of judgment, if you must go that far. If the doctrine is accurately portrayed, then why shouldn't it be compared and contrasted to the precious doctrine of Christ? Listen to what John said. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try or prove or test the spirits, whether they are of God, because... Many false prophets have gone out into the world, 1 John 4, 1, and that's why the New Testament was still being written. What do you think about today? Then, oh, well, just don't mention names. That's another thing. Just don't mention names. Well, again, we assume that the beliefs of a person are fairly and accurately represented. Now, of course, we don't want to say you believe something when you don't. In the debates I've had and the debates I've been around, I've always said to my opponent, I do not want to misrepresent you. And if I do, you correct me. Often a doctrine can be addressed without a name being mentioned. I understand that. 
But is it required by the scriptures not to mention names? That's the question. And the answer is no, it's not. Why do we find the following? Paul wrote to Timothy, a young preacher. And he says in 1 Timothy 1, 19 through 20, Holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith, they have, uh, faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, that's just one case. He called their names. He wanted everybody to know it. If I, if I had a million dollars, and I said, I want to give this million dollars to, and you'd be saying, call my name, call my name, call my name. That's probably going on in your mind. <laughs> Listen if he calls my name. Uh, but we don't mind it. So it's not that you're opposed to calling names. It's just you don't want to be called a sinner when you are one. But it didn't stop there. In 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18, he talked about Hymenaeus and Philetus. John mentioned Diotrephes in 2 John 9 through 10. Revelation 2, 6 and 15 mentions the Nicolaitans. All of these in a bad light because they were wrong or they taught false doctrines and the people need to know where it was coming from. These are individuals. They're groups. There are warnings to be on guard and in particular for what to be watchful. Have you ever noticed um, some of these police shows? They're trying to get a description of something. Maybe it's the car. They know it's a, 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 a yellow Chevrolet. Well, that's fine. That sets it apart from a lot. Well, they sure do like it if you've got a, if you've got a license number. All that has to do with identification. When I travel to the Philippines and Indonesia and a few of those places, I was warned not to drink the water or even use the ice in my drinks. In Indonesia, when I took a shower, I take my mouth shut. I didn't want to get it in my mouth. There are similar warnings south of the border down Mexico way, and sometimes it's called Montezuma's Revenge when you get a hold of some of that. Is this, if I warn you about that water and ice in those countries, is that being unfair to the Filipinos or Mexicans or Indonesians? Is that a put down? Are they being harmed because I was warned about their water supply? Are they personally being disparaged? Yet when all is said and done, it comes down to this. Don't drink the water. And if you do, you won't next time. If you live through it. Warnings are given about people and groups because their teachings are harmful, and if you believe them and die that way, you will lose your soul. The warnings should be accurate. Yes, nobody denies that, but the warnings are needful. It is the job of preachers of the gospel, especially to warn of false doctrines and false teachers. For elders to try to say, we don't want our preacher mentioning anything negative about anybody. They ought not be elders. The congregation will rise up and remove them for they're not qualified and they're not doing what shepherds of the flock do. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make Full proof of thy ministry. 2 Timothy 4, 1 through 5. Paul to Timothy. Now seeing there's no clergy in the Lord's church. And according to our several ability, we're all teachers of the truth. That applies to every one of us in that sense. The teaching is not just to the ones committing the error. It's also to warn others not to fall into the same trap. Propagators of falsehoods don't want their names mentioned because fewer people would listen to them. 
Propagators of falsehoods don't want their doctrines described or refuted because they want a chance to persuade the naive. Why make Satan's work easy? I want to make his work as, as tough as I can. I want to draw near to God, and he'll draw near to me. And I know to resist Satan, and he'll flee from me. And I know something about how to do both in the teaching of the gospel. Don't be found hampering the spread of the truth or the exposure of error by insisting that preachers and teachers or that anyone in the church refrain from doing what Jesus and the apostles did. Brethren, it's just a part of being godly in the age in which we live when all ages overall are certainly ungodly ages. Will we be a lamp of light wherever we are every day on the job and school and our families? Or will we compromise? Will we be quiet when we ought to speak up? Will we be quiet because we know if we say something, somebody's going to bristle and jump right back in our face? Well, that's, uh, that's just an opportunity as far as I'm concerned. And I don't think David would appreciate me backing off in view of how he dealt with Goliath. And that's not in the Bible, just to take up space. And neither will it be with you. If you'll be faithful to God and all the New Testament teaches about faithfulness, whether it's husband, wife, father, mother, child, whoever you are, wherever you are every day of the week, to be strong in the Lord and the power of His might, to stand up and be counted. God will be with you, and He'll never forsake you. And I thank God have lived long enough preaching the gospel to where not only can I say from the Bible, which I've always done, that that's the case because it's God's word and true, but because I've experienced it. He's never forsaken me. He's never left me through thick and thin. And all that does for me is let it come because I'm going to be there to the best of my ability to meet it head on. If you're not a child of God, are you willing to be a warrior for Christ? Because when you become a Christian, you're a part of his army, a soldier of the cross. And if you're of that army and is sort of sitting on the sidelines, you need to realize the Lord's not happy about that. If you need to become a Christian, believe with all of your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be buried with your Lord in baptism for the remission of sins. The Lord will add you to His church, and there you can serve Him faithfully until time is no more. As a child of God, are you faithful in the full meaning of the word faithful in your personal lives? If you need to repent, we beg of you, we plead with you to do so. Confess those sins and pray God for forgiveness. If you're subject to the Lord's blessed call, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.